Plato tells us of a cave within which is the world. Those of us inside the cave are shackled. We sit on stone benches. We face the inside wall of the cave. We are aware of people beside us. We're aware of people in front. To an extent, we're aware of the people behind us. We can't move. We can only look forward. This is our world. At the mouth of the cave is an enormous fire, forever burning. Outside the fire are the guards. The guards patrol back and forth across the mouth of the cave. Those of us inside the cave see their shadows played out on the wall as a form of tapestry, a form of reality. This is what we know. One day, one of us gets free of the shackles. They stand, they work their way past the benches, they navigate around the fire, they evade the guards. They step into a whole new world. They see light, they see color, they feel the warmth of the sun, the breeze of the wind, the feel of the dirt under their feet. They see everything anew. They are so overwhelmed by this experience that they are compelled to run back into the cave to share it with us. They choose their moment, they make it past the guards, they make it round the fire, through the benches, to the inside wall of the cave, where they turn and lay everything out to us. This wonder that they have experienced, this brave new world. Breathlessly, they wait our response. We pause, we reflect, and we do the only thing logically and rationally we can do in this circumstance. We kill them. Our sense of identity is very firmly entwined with our sense of place. It's not uniquely driven by place, but where we find ourselves, this can be geographic, it can be organizational, it can be associational, but where we find ourselves impacts how we see us and how we see other people. Now, I've been interested in identity for a long time. I was born in a country that no longer exists. I went to high school in a country other than that one and other than the country of my parents. And most of my professional life has been spent in countries other than those countries, none of which are the countries of my parents. I get asked the question a lot, well, where's home? How long have you been away from home? When are you going home? And that question changes the longer that you are away from home. My answer is relatively simple. For me, home is wherever my wife and daughter are because that's the construct that creates the identity. Second motivating factor to think about identity is from my daughter. My daughter is now almost eight years old. It's important that she's almost eight and not seven. We moved to the UAE when she was six months old. She was born in Malaysia. So she has no memory, no attachment to Malaysia. To the extent where if you ask her now, where are you from, she'll say Dubai. Her parents are not from Dubai. She wasn't born in Dubai, but she is from Dubai. When we were in the process of moving from Malaysia, we were looking at jobs, my wife and I, in many countries around the world. Both my wife and I have moved around a lot, and we're quite comfortable with this. And it really struck me thinking how different our daughter's life would have been if we'd moved to a country other than the UAE. This is not a better or worse judgment. This is simply a question of difference. Had we moved somewhere where it snowed or rained or if we'd moved to an inner city rather than a suburb? And then I started thinking, that's not actually the question. It's not how different her life would have been. It's how different she would have been. Because our environment, our space, impacts our identity. We are different people in different climates, in different weathers. We are different people 
based on the people around us. Now, I've never particularly felt that I was of somewhere. I am from somewhere, but I have never felt of somewhere. I have friends who have grown up in a single city. They may have traveled abroad to study, but they've returned home. They are of a place. You can sense it. They are an extension of their city. Their city is an extension of them. I never had that. Having said that, I did spend my primary school time in a small village in England. You could walk anywhere. You walked to school, you walked to the playing field. You knew everybody. Everybody knew you. Everybody pretty much looked like everybody else. I would have been essentially the same age as our daughter is now, seven or eight years old. We were taking part in a musical festival, makes it sound grand, a musical event at a nearby high school, eight miles away. Now, eight miles is not a long way, but when you live in a village where you can walk everywhere, eight miles is a very long way away. During a break from the rehearsal, the group of us from our school were in the playground, and there are other kids milling around. One of the older girls in our group, she would have been eight or nine, said, no, 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 don't go play over there. We don't know those people. Stay here, stay safe. Now, I don't think that that was particularly shocking at the time, but that stayed with me for almost 40 years. So it must have had a relative impact. Our sense of identity, our cave, was quite strong. It was built by our geography. And what that did and does is a create a sense of us and them. We build a reality of the other. Now, contrast this to uh, my daughter, who grows, uh, is growing up in a multicultural, international environment, where in a class of 25 kids, most are one of one. Now, when everybody is foreign, nobody's foreign. It changes your perception. It changes the way you see yourself. It changes the way you see the world around you and how you relate to that. And this sense of us and other is a form of labeling, which, in addition to geography, is a strong motivating factor that identifies who we are and how we identify ourselves. I've been reading a lot of literature recently that looks at retelling Greek myths and legends, particularly from the female perspective. I'm not sure if this is simple curiosity or the genuine privilege of being a girl dad. When you have kids, your identity changes, your perspective changes. You realize every stuffed toy has a male name. And you think, why is that? So you switch, and then they all have female names. And you think, well, why is that? And then you switch back. But I've been reading a lot of literature by particular people like Madeline Miller and Natalie Haynes. And one in particular recently deals with Medusa. Now, Medusa, at least in Western thought, is a fairly common known character. She's a monster. She's a gorgon. She has snakes for hair. She'll turn you to stone just by looking at you. Luckily, she's defeated by a hero. So everything's okay with the world. When we think about the story more accurately, and we change the words, and we change the labels, the narrative changes, the identity changes, the story changes. What we actually have is a young girl, abused, outcast, vilified, murdered. Now, the story changes completely, and our relationship to that story changes. Perhaps our empathy goes up, our discomfort grows. But the story, the identity, the core, is sometimes what we make of it. An example my daughter likes a lot. Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer has a very shiny nose, and if you ever saw him, you would even say it glows. What we also know is reindeer that keep their antlers at the wintertime and reindeer that have red noses are female. Rudolph is not a boy reindeer. Rudolph's a girl reindeer. Changes the narrative. Tells us something about what we do with stories. Tells us something about the nature of identity. It's interesting, I think, as we get older, 
we become perhaps more fearful. We become more risk adverse. We want things to be simpler. We have more to lose, perhaps. We become more comfortable with the cave. We become more comfortable with the constructs of the way we put labels on things. These labels, however, over time, like bricks of a cave, create a narrative arc that we conform to. We buy into the reality of what we are called or what we call ourselves. So if you are a mathematician, that gives you a sense of what a mathematician should do. Right? If you are a baker, if you are a doctor, if you are a professor, if you are tall, if you are short, we buy into the narrative of what we believe this should do. And over time, we simply conform to it. Some of these labels we may actively chase. Some of these we may have inherit. Some may just be forced upon us. But this narrative arc is a constraint. It is a cave within which we live. At times for security, at times for stability, at times just for peace. And other times, it's a set of shackles. As you become a parent, your perspective changes, your identity changes, you have something else which is a priority. Even what you are called changes. You lose the sense of who you are, you become her dad. In the school playground, I don't know any of the parents' names, but I know that she's his mom or he's her dad. It shifts. And what's really interesting with children is you can see how they try identities on for size. So we read Sherlock Holmes, and my daughter starts investigating these crimes around the house, usually perpetrated by the cat. We read Pippi Longstocking, and she starts sleeping upside down in the bed. We watch Back to the Future, and now she's playing air guitar and skateboarding. She's not any one of these things uniquely. She's all of these things at the same time. I'm not quite sure at what point we lose that how we label ourselves and how we identify ourselves. These markers that are often character-driven, but then we push out into the world as a way of defining ourselves and understanding, such that we are seen by other people in a very particular way. We do this as adults. We put an image out into the world. That's how we are recognized. That's how we recognize each other. It becomes more singularly defined. But why can't we have a cave with many rooms? Why are we so easily defined by ourselves and by others? I was curious about this, so I asked my daughter, what is it you want to be when you grow up? And she said, a lot of things. I want to be an author, um, baseball player, ballet dancer, actor. And I said, I'm not sure you can be all of those things. And she said, why not? I already am. And as in most conversations that you have with kids, you don't have the right answer to that type of wisdom. Other than to say, no, 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 you need to live in a cave with one room. Why? I was following on from that. I was really curious how she defines herself in relation to the world around her. And so I asked her, when you meet somebody new, what do you ask them? What are the first couple of questions that you, you ask? And she says, well, um, how old are you? Because that's pretty important. Do you, have you got any pets? What are your pets' names? Have you got any brothers and sisters? What are their names? What do you like to do? What do you like to play? Do you want to come and play with me? And then she said, what do you ask? And I said, I'll usually ask their name and then I'll ask what they do for a living. Because that's the box, the construct, that allows me as an adult to understand them in relation to me. That job, ah, I know what that job is, or I don't know what that job is, but I have a set of expectations. I have a nice box I can put you in, and now I understand how we relate to each other. I may be interested in your job, I may know nothing about your job, but at least I can place you. It works quite well. It's very, very limiting, but it is a marker of identity. We were in the playground 
fairly recently, and she comes running over to me and says, oh, um, my new friend wants to go and skate around the corner. Is that okay? And I said, yeah, sure, I can see you. Go ahead. Oh, hey, what's your friend's name? And as she's running away, she says, don't know. What a wonderful way to use identity and engage with the world around you. In that moment, there are two people simply sharing an experience that they both enjoy. They don't care where they come from. They don't care. They don't even care how old they are. They don't care about the legacy, the markers, the identity. They simply care that they can share an experience. That's a very interesting way of looking at the world. It's a very interesting way of changing our perspective as to how we identify us, them, other, or together. As we get older, this narrative arc takes over. We have too much to lose. We don't have enough flexibility. We don't have the time. We don't have the freedom. We are what we are. And what we are is therefore who we are. With very little freedom, perhaps, to deviate. Which is a shame. It's understandable, but it's still a shame. When I was leaving Malaysia, I'd been with the same institution since I was 18 years old. I genuinely assumed I would be with that institution until I retired. That was who I was. I was a part of this organization. That was my identity. And like that, it was gone. I was no longer a member of the organization. That was a very difficult thing to understand because that had become my identity. And so I started chasing these jobs that I thought was where my narrative arc was supposed to take me. I am X, I must do Y. Well, the genuine question is, why? It's not relevant. It's not necessary. My daughter's been really enjoying Matilda, both the book and the musical, recently. And in the immortal words of an eight-year-old girl, Romeo and Juliet were star-crossed lovers before they even met. And she asks, why didn't they just change their story? Why didn't they take the opportunity to deviate from the narrative? Why didn't they take a chance to look about identity and say, why can't I be this? Why can't I do that as well? I think it's important that every now and then, we take the opportunity to step outside the cave. We take the opportunity to perhaps try to change our story a little bit. Try to rethink our identity as being constrained by things that are superimposed and not things that come from within. Step outside the cave, try to change your story a little bit, and with any luck, you might make a new friend. <laughs>